Welcome to Author Author. My name is Sven Michael Davison, and today I have Teresa Burrell, author of her Advocate series. And today she'll be talking about her life as a lawyer, then a published author, and then switching to indie author. And she'll be talking about how she drew on her life experiences to create the Advocate series, and also her stint selling Tiki Hut. So uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, and here we go. My okay. first book was The Advocate. Yeah. And I wrote that while I was practicing law. I was an advocate for abused children in juvenile court. I worked for 12 years in juvenile court as a, an attorney, and I represented abused children and delinquent children. I also represented parents. I did both sides of the coin. The biggest part of my caseload was children. Now, I had a case that bothered me, and I decided to write a book about it. It does not follow the case. The book is definitely fictionalized. And I wrote that while I was still practicing law. And I was working about 14 or 15 hours a day, seven days a week. I was in court all day long, and then I'd come back to the office and I'd do some work. I'd work or prepare for trials or whatever. Um, the weekends I spent most of those out visiting children in foster homes or in um, institutions or group homes or wherever they might be. And. <laughs> Okay, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. typical cat behavior. Yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah, she's going to She knows do exactly it. where the camera is. <laughs> That's right. She's, yeah, exactly. There you go. So I, I decided to write the book, and I'd always wanted to write. I just had never done it before. So I decided to just um, sit down and write it. I set my alarm an hour and a half early every morning, and I got up and I wrote. So when you say an hour and a half earlier, you're talking about 4 a.m.? Yeah, about that. Wow, yeah. okay. It's about 4.30, I think. I usually started to get ready about 6. Wow. And are so. you a morning person, naturally? or? I am a morning person. Well, that's good. I, I get up early, but um, I, like, I like to say I go to bed late, but I make up for it by getting up early. <laughs> I don't sleep a lot. <laughs> then do you need coffee to function, or do you, are you just pretty much just I up and I can't drink and... caffeine. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, no, I don't use coffee. I drink tea, but not caffeinated. It's always herbal. So okay. no, I, I get up and I'm ready to go. So you're getting up super early. Uh, you still have your crazy work schedule, mm -hmm. trying to write the advocate. How long did it take you to write it? Six months. And at the end of it, I, I wrote it really just to see if I could write a book. That's, that was my motivation, because I'd always wanted to write. And I thought, well, you know, this is a good idea. Let's just try this and see what happens. And not only did I enjoy it, I, it, it felt easy. And when I say easy, I mean the words went down. I had lots of words on a page when I got done, and lots of pages, and I went from beginning to end. Then I went to a writer's conference, Southern California Writer's Conference. I went to some classes. I'd never been to any kind of writing classes at all. And I realized a lot of the things I was doing wrong. And so I went home and I edited it. I went through it about, I don't know, three or four times. Went back to the Writers' Con Conference, submitted 20 pages to a publisher, and she asked for my manuscript. But I'd let it set for a little while, and I'd forgotten how long it was. Hmm. And she asked me how many words it, it was, and I said, I don't know, I think it's about 100,000. She told me to go home, cut 10,000, and then send it to her. Well, I went home back to the computer and it was 120,000 oh. <laughs> words. <laughs> so I had a lot of cutting to do. I got it down to about, I think, 94 or something, and I sent it to her anyway. And then she chopped my last chapter off and she said, your story ended here. She was right, but <laughs> so it got, still got it down to about where she wanted it. She took it, she published <clears throat> it, Okay. and that started my uh, career. So when did you make the decision to stop practicing law? It was after I wrote the book, when I got published, but it wasn't the reason I stopped. I was importing some things from the Philippines, these big tiki huts. Wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. Interesting. That's, that's you another, wear a lot of hats. That's another story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they call them kubos, and they're like gazebos. You walk inside and bamboo bars and stuff. I saw them in a magazine, and no one had them in Southern California. There was one woman in California, and she was up in Northern California that was selling these. I got on a plane, flew to the Philippines, and set up manufacturing, and started bringing them in. Wow. By myself. <laughs> so you were planning on so, getting, transitioning out of, out of law anyway, it sounds I was like. Trans you were <laughs> exactly. 
I you're, was. You were looking for either he's like, okay, if books don't work, tiki huts. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always put those two together. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> everyone? Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of changes at juvenile court, and there was a lot of things that were different, and it was time to make a break from what I was doing at juvenile court. And I didn't really want to start a new area of law. So I was looking for something else at the time. Was it the workload or was it just the, the experiences you were having with other people? I mean, it's, I would, my personal feeling is it would probably be depressing. I would have a hard time mm-hmm. with it. Um, I'm just wondering it, what got to you if you want to talk about that. But I mean. No, that's fine. No, I, I carried a, I had a caseload of 450 wow. at a time when wow. I was, at, especially at the end. Um, but most of my career at juvenile court is a huge caseload. Cases last a while because they come into the system and then children don't get returned right away. These are the, the dependency cases. And they often end up, children end up getting adopted or something and they terminate parental rights. So that takes, the process takes a while, it takes several years. Some cases were in the review stages and other cases were in brand new. So 450, it's a lot of cases, but yeah. they're at all different stages. Then I was doing delinquency stuff as well, so there was a regime change, if you will, at juvenile court. We got a new presiding judge, and they decided to go a different route, and I was on a panel of attorneys who were appointed by the court to represent kids. They just made some major changes, so a lot of us decided to go a different direction. And sometimes it can get very depressing practicing law in juvenile court. So... Tiki huts. How long were you selling those? I had a. Did you open I, up a, a I, brick and mortar? Yeah, I did. Wow. Well, I I had a warehouse, and I sold them at different places, and I took orders, and and I did s- some displays at home shows and things like that. That's how I got started doing the home shows for my books because I was familiar with that s- system. That's how I displayed them it was at shows, and then. I wrote the book while I was still practicing, and then we had all the changes, and I'd already started doing the Tiki Hut stuff before the publisher picked up my book. So you didn't sleep? No, I didn't sleep. Okay. You still don't sleep. I still don't. (laughs) It took a little while before I, because I, I went to that conference, I did some editing, and then I submitted the book, and then it was like a year before it got published. So I was still doing the Tiki Huts during that time. And then I did the Tiki Huts and the books for a while, and then I stopped the Tiki Huts, so. So how many books had you written by the time you closed the doors on Tiki Hut? Just a couple, two or three, maybe. Okay. Were you actually literally selling Tiki Huts and books at the same home show? No. Okay. No, I didn't do the books there then. I hadn't figured that out yet. (laughs) Okay. At some point, you went from a publisher to independent publishing, didn't you? Yes. And how did you make that decision? The reason I made the decision was money. I had a really good friend, Jeff Sherratt, who has since passed away, but he had the same first two publishers I had, actually. He had one book with the first one and one with the second one, and then he decided to go on his own. I stayed a little bit longer, but he kept pulling me out, saying, this is the way to go, this is the way to go. I finally realized that he had some pretty good words of wisdom, and, and I went for the fourth book on my own and then I got my rights back on the first three so now I have all of my own books. My first book I would stand in Barnes and Noble for three days maybe sell a hundred books and my royalties would amount to less than fifty dollars. Ouch. It didn't pay for my gas. I did make a little bit more with my second publisher Okay. but it wasn't you know it wasn't a whole lot. By the time you you left the bookstores, you also left your publishers, so you had a whole new business strategy. I did. Was that an easy transition for you? I mean, did it actually all kind of come together? I mean, because at that point you're producing the book, you're finding someone to make your cover, you're... Did you, had you been doing your own editing before that too? Um, or was the publisher providing all of that to you? I'm just kind of wondering what kind of services you were getting before, mm-hmm. and then obviously everything you were finding yourself afterwards, but... Yeah, well, they did have editors, but some of the editors I had were better than others. And I always did it, had it edited anyway beforehand okay. before I even sent it in the first time but um, and so I kept I kept that editor that's the same editor I had for the last for every book I've done actually how, how did you find her she was a friend of mine okay <laughs> and we met in um, another business but the tiki hut or the no or something else oh, okay. I'm not going to go into that one <laughs> okay 
<laughs> Sounds uh, interesting. I've but done okay. a lot of things. <laughs> I've had a lot of careers. Um, but she was really good. She was an editor in her own right, so it wasn't just a friend. But she had already stopped working as an editor, and she names Marilee Wood. And Marilee did only my books. And if she had edited the first three books, how much editing after that did the publisher do? Was it very minimal? Was it anything? or? It was minimal. The second publisher, actually, for the third book, it was The Advocate's Conviction. I had this concept in there because I had this case about devil worshipping. It wasn't like creepy or anything, but it had some satanic stuff in it. Mm. Just what it appeared to be going on in, in this home. It was a case I'd been involved in. So I had that kind of throughout the book. And the editor said, now we've got to take this out. I rewrote it taking that out, and I had this woman worshiping this oak tree. So we get, I turn it back in, and then they go, yeah, that's not working, it lost its punch. <laughs> so I had to go redo that and put it back in. And it ended up actually a combination of the two things. It actually worked better in the, in the long run. And then my editor had already gone through the book and did a lot of stuff before then, but that was the big change, the big things that they did. Was also just kind of control over what you had to write, was that part of your your reasoning and going out on your own, or was that not such a big deal? You know, I think that could have been, but they didn't, neither of my publishers did a lot about, they, they weren't really into so much changing what I had. Okay. And I'd like to think that it was just so good they didn't need to, but I, I think it was more that they really didn't feel like they needed to do that unless something was really bad. So, Home Show, I'm kind of curious. I mean, is that something you're still doing, or is that something you've kind of tried out with books and and you don't do so much? That doesn't strike me as the kind of crowd that buys <laughs> books. I, who um, knew? I know. <laughs> well, home shows are interesting because people go there, they're fixing their homes. A lot of times the couples come together to those home shows, and the men are looking at the construction stuff, and the women are over looking at my books. Oh, okay. There's a lot of people that come to the shows that still read. I mean, they're, they're, they're still readers. It's just not what they came for. Yeah. But when they see, they'll, they'll often stop, and I go through the same process I went through when I was in the bookstores, once they stop. <clears throat> I'm wondering, is a booth at a home show comparable to a booth at a uh, book fair, I mean, the pricing-wise? Uh, no, it's a little, it's, it's different. I mean, well, it's, actually, it is kind of close. Okay. It is kind of close. And I don't get as much response as I get at a book festival. If I have to drive to Tucson and stay in Tucson to do a book festival, there's extra cost in that, too. Book festivals aren't that close, so... Yeah. And the home shows I do are only in Southern California. Okay, gotcha. Inland Empire, mostly Orange County. I do about eight or ten a year. You are number uh, of children. How many siblings do you have? I'm number nine out of nine. Wow. I'm All right, baby. to the baby, yeah. Yeah, I never let them forget that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they made sure I didn't forget it when I was young, so okay. now that I'm older, I can rub it in. So <laughs> there, were, there was nine of us. There's six left. So. Okay, gotcha. Are you a Southern Californian, or did you...? I was born in Minnesota. Oh, okay. Whereabouts? And I wasn't too far from the border, up by um, East Grand Forks. It's a little town, though, a very small town. Not far from the North Dakota border, either. Okay. Not far from Fargo, actually. The first time we left, I was five. We came to California. My dad didn't have work, and he decided to come to California to find work. Did they come he, here because of the warmth, or what was the draw? He, he had a tractor. We had a farm, if you can call it that. I mean, there wasn't much on it, but we lived in the country, and he had a tractor, and he would work for the county and mow the highways. And most of the people that did that also had a snow plow. And so in the winters, they could plow the highways. Well, Daddy didn't have a snow plow and he couldn't afford to get one, so he didn't have work all winter. So my brother had joined the Marine Corps, my oldest brother, and he was out in California and he said, come out here, there's work. So Daddy threw us all in the back of an old panel pickup and we drove to California. And we followed the crops and picked potatoes and stuff like that. And whatever oranges, whatever was in, in season. The whole family? Yep. How long did you guys do that? Well, we did it the winter, and then we went back in the spring. And we did that. We went back and forth for five years. We came out here in the winter, went back in the summer, in the spring, and stayed. So from five to ten, you were out picking oranges in the winter? Yeah. Wow. And going back and forth. 
oranges were easy, potatoes were tough. <laughs> yeah. But, and we did olives too, I remember those. I liked that because I was small enough I could crawl, crawl way up in the top of the tree and get the olives. Did you get to eat any while you were doing that? Or? The olives are nasty, we tried. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, I mean, we could have oranges and I remember we did watermelons. I wasn't very good at watermelons because I was too little, I couldn't lift them. Pretty bit, yeah. But uh, we did that for a while and then when I was 10, uh, my mother passed away and daddy decided to stay out here after that and so we he got a job with the water district for Lake Elsinore and so we lived in Lake Elsinore that's where I finished growing up and you went to school out here too I mean as far as college and stuff or yep I stayed in Southern California for for uh, junior college community college and for uh, then I went I graduated from San Bernardino State and then I taught school for 12 years and then went back to law school. Zero to Six Figures is a marketing book for writers. I actually was able to get to that point, go from zero with my writing to a six-figure income. So many authors and writers ask me what I'm doing and so I decided to write a book about it. Please subscribe so my dad can make more videos like this. Thank you.